Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Uh, my name is Tal Safani. If you don't know me, I'm the CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute. It's a special honor for me to be standing here to open this event featuring the Institute's founder, Dr. Leonard Peikoff. Dr. Peikoff has been a teacher, a mentor, and a hero for so many of us. His clarity of thought and presentation, his distinct style and humor have brought thousands and thousands of people closer to understanding objectivism and applying it in their own lives. It's thrilling to think that we're going to be adding another Leonard recorded session to a long list of timeless classic presentations that will continue to enlighten audiences around the world for decades and centuries to come. I want to thank my team at the Ayn Rand Institute and David Steve uh, team for organizing this in a very short notice in this beautiful sat Saturday afternoon event. And I especially want to thank Lisa, Lisa Van Dam, for making this event happen. Lisa is the founder of the Van Dam Academy here in Orange County and a longtime friend of Dr. Dr. Peacock. I want to invite Lisa to the stage to give an introduction for today's lecture. Thank you. It is an honor to introduce this lecture for many reasons, not the least of which is that I credit lectures by Leonard Peikoff with having inspired two of the central passions of my life, education and literature, and with giving me guidance in the pursuit of them. And tonight, he will be offering us all inspiration and guidance for the pursuit of a potential new passion. Let me tell you a little bit about how this lecture came to be. A few years ago, I went to Leonard's birthday party, where he introduced me to his friend Art, a neighbor of his in the apartment complex where he was then living. Leonard told me at that time, his voice vibrating with enthusiasm, about their weekly meetings to watch and discuss operetta, about Art's unsurpassed knowledge and unmatched collection, and about how operetta had become, for Leonard, a new love. A few months later, I had dinner with Leonard at his house, and he gave me an off-the-cuff account of the unique value that he believed the art form of operetta could provide. I listened to it with keen interest, which was this, I listened to this brief introduction with keen interest. It was equal parts intellectual insight and soulful inspiration, and I was desperate to know more. Fortunately, he said it was a subject he wanted to share with anyone who would listen, and he decided to work on developing his thoughts. Shortly after that, Leonard came down with COVID, which took the wind out of his sails, to say the least. I had a chance to speak to him while he was in the hospital, and he told me, breathless this time for more reasons than one, that working on his operetta lecture was what had been getting him through. His voice was weak, he was under strict orders to conserve his energy, and yet he talked to me for over an hour, at one point recounting a favorite scene from an operetta, the mere description of which brought him and me to tears. Thankfully, he recovered from COVID and came home. When I was speaking to him on the phone one day shortly afterward, he said to me, and this is a verbatim quote, I think I missed my calling. I should have been building sets for operettas in Vienna. <laughs> Leonard Peikoff missed his calling. <laughs> Perhaps that was hyperbole, but look what it tells us about his passion. Now, Leonard is apprehensive about overselling his subject. A response to art is so profoundly personal, and communicating its value is no simple task. But I told him that if he loves something this much, every one of us will benefit from knowing why. And some of us, I am certain, will come away with the drive, the tools, and the motivation to make it a passion of our own. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Leonard Peikoff.
Now you're going to see the two lecterns and all the equipment, little snacks that my divorce teacher gave me. So just don't worry about that. Uh, I'll give you a clue to it. My doctor was examining me from head to toe, and I asked him, well, what do you think? He said, you've got a good mind. <laughs> OK, uh, let's, let's start on operetta. A student of mine once captured most Americans' idea of operetta. This is what he said. A guy named Arch talks in some foreign babble to a gal named Gypsy, and suddenly they jump up from the table and start to belt out some tune. She is so high and loud, who can sit through it? I don't get it, it's ridiculous. Now, unquote. <coughs> I hope I can give you today a better idea of this art form. And at the end, I'll concretize my abstractions by playing for you some excerpts on DVD. <laughs> I first heard about operetta from Ayn Rand, who loved the form. We used to sit on her couch and exchange grins at one piece after the, another, while she often conducted with her little uh, baton. She is the one who introduced me to the whole field. Now let me define my subject today. This is not to be an academic analysis of operetta. I'm not knowledgeable enough for anything like that. I'm giving you today an account of what the operators I myself know and respond to and my reasons for it. And I'm going to tell you in four parts. I always have a structure when you're lecture. Intro, introduction. Story, what kind of stories do operate it? Music, and then the last one, uh, what I put in the title, but that's the last section here. Operetta as virtual reality. <laughs> okay. Um, where's this one? Yeah. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> Introduction. Introduction. Operetta is a story conveyed to a great extent through music. Music which is not a mere accompaniment or background, but an indispensable element of the whole. There are two other uh, music story combinations, grand opera and Broadway type musicals. All three tell stories and all feature musical, music as essential. Near the last, I'll explain to you what I see as the essential difference between operetta and the other two. Now, of these three forms, unfortunately, operetta had the shortest lifespan. It started around 1865 and continued until about the mid-30s, so a lifespan of about 70 years. And I assume that you know, in general at least, the overall history of that period. It was the period of the Industrial Revolution, uh, with all the discoveries and wealth that made man's life so much longer and easier. It was the period of Romanticism and art, of no wars in, uh, in decades, of continual progress. And with it, the universal conviction that pro progress is the inevitable, uh, that the future can only be even better. And a perfect expression of the progress was the development of operetta. But it did not last, it was badly wounded by World Wars I and II and the Great Depression, and then was killed by Hitler. <coughs> Now, operettas were created and enjoyed in many countries and forms. I'm going to talk to you today only about my favorite form, which is Viennese operetta, obviously coming from Vienna. And I can be even more specific, because Viennese operetta is divided into two periods. The Golden Age, that's about 1865 to the turn of the century, and the Silver Age from there till the mid-30s. Now, if you want to call me obsessed, which several people have, um, it's the Silver Age that gets me. And of course, I agree. 
uh, that there's some very good operettas uh, in, in the uh, golden age. But in my view, the music is too loud, too fast, too dominant over the story, and the work is full of comedic self-mocking and plain farce, none of which appeals to me. The Silver Age, by contrast, created intimate, emotional, lyrical operetta. Now, one critic, who I think is very good, defines the Golden Age as essentially galloping foolery and the silver as intoxicating glamour. And I agree, and that's what I want. Now, the greatest and most famous composers in the Silver Age were Emmerich Kallman. Uh, he's the best of all, in my opinion. Franz Lehar and Joseph uh, Johann Strauss II, the first is his father. And he is a mixed case. Now let me tell you specifically what for me is so distinctive about the Silver Age. And that leads us to part two, the story. <clears throat> In operetta, story like music is indispensable. You cannot, and I stress this, you cannot grasp or respond to an operetta by listening to a CD of its music. You cannot. The music, of course, is crucial but operetta is not a concert. It is not a concert of separate songs. Its songs are connected because they are integrated with an ongoing logical progression of events. Now, who created these stories? You might think it's the composers, but it's not. Uh, they were created, uh, there were, they were highly uh, specialized musicians, uh, the, the composers. Uh, and the stories required specialized storytellers, in effect, playwrights, and they were called the librettists. The composer usually approved in advance a generalized idea of the story, but their work had to be finished before he could start on this, on his. So forgive me, I'm uh, getting old. <coughs> the, <coughs> The librettists not only wrote the story, they also indicated the points at which a song of a certain kind should appear. So there was often a second man working with the story man, a poet perhaps who would write the lyrics with the story man. Uh, and he often uh, wrote the lyrics of a song that had not yet been written. And then the composer had to compose to his lyrics. <clears throat> now let's get to story. What kind of story did the Silver Age librettists write? Mostly love stories. Two people fall in love and then fight to preserve and live by their love against all the obstacles in their paths. In operetta, these lovers are good people, sincere and appealing, because they are motivated by a rational purpose which is of life or death importance to them. Now, to tell this kind of story convincingly, you need a third element, and that's the third one is presented also by the li libretto. So it's story, lyrics, and dialogue. Dialogue interspersed throughout. And I mean now by dialogue, speaking, not singing. Ordinary speaking, not declamation or recitation. Simply two or more people sitting around talking just as we do daily. <laughs> now, opera, opera does not have dialogue, but operetta does. <laughs> dialogue is essential <coughs> to operetta because it is one of the two things that makes the story fully real to the audience. <laughs> the other is music, as we'll see. Dialogue is the thing that gives us the facts the important details, the ones we need to make the characters real life people as against being merely good singers. <clears throat> For example, what is the character's, uh, uh, what is the lover's character when he, um, he, I'm gonna use he instead of he or she, but I hope the women will accept that. <clears throat> uh, 
what is the lover's character uh, when he's not singing? What kind of man is he in daily life? What qualities does he love in her? And how about the outside world? Uh, is there some government or big event outside, maybe even a war, that threatens them? And very crucial here, which we get from dialogue, is the backstory, the events in the past that led to the events we see on stage. All of this information is crucial for a story to become convincing. Uh, <clears throat> and you cannot get this information from singing alone, even if it has excellent lyrics. It can't possibly uh, uh, give you that information. You can't start singing, oh, there was a war with Franz Joseph. I mean, <laughs> so uh, this is what, uh, operated, uh, what dialogue gives you. <laughs> now, I want to clarify one point. You know that I'm biased in favor of operetta, but it's obvious to me and to anyone that operetta stories are nowhere near as good as the ones in great literature. Many of the stories are ingenious and suspenseful, but none begin to have the brilliantly original and breathtaking plots of Hugo, Rostand, and the rest. By itself, and I admit this, without the music, the librettist work would be of little or no value. The story is essential, yes, but as we'll see, it is music that makes the huge difference. So operetta stories are love stories, but not all love stories are the same. No, there are a great many variants in the stories. During the period uh, when operetta flourished, the librettists mostly took as their context a feudal society, which meant that the lover's obstacles derived from the class system. There were the aristocrats, kings, barons, and so on, and the commoners. Now, this distinction has nothing to do with moral character. There are good and bad people in each group. And, but the lover's problem is related to that background because the problem is usually derived from the fact that the feudal establishment uh, condemned any romantic relationship between an aristocrat and a commoner. <clears throat> now this type of class distinction <coughs> is dead today. You must therefore accept the stories as you would a novel set in the past or science fiction set in the future. In either case, that's what's called suspending disbelief. In other words, accepting in your role as consumer of art the reality of the world being presented, assuming it's uh, intelligible, not modern art. <sighs> now, not all stories, even in this period, pertain to feudal classes. There are many possibilities. I wish I could regale you with all of them so you wouldn't think, oh, it's just a feudal. <laughs> In one variant, for example, the head waiter of a fancy restaurant loves uh, the female owner who scorns him until after a maze of restaurant-related events, including customers who sing their need for the check, true love at the end triumphs. <laughs> and there is even an operetta, believe this or not, written by, Charles, by Kalman, in which Charleston fans, they represent uh, Americans, clash with Waltz fans, who represent Europe, and the lovers, each from the opposite camp, have to find each other by surpassing this clash. So, <coughs> now, <coughs> another feature virtually unique to the Silver Age, a feature essential to my response. The lovers are really in love, heart and soul. Their love is presented as serious. In fact, I get so involved that I actually root for the couple like a sports fan. Uh, but the, therefore, it's the opposite of anything tongue-in-cheek, frivolous, comical. But this doesn't mean that you're supposed to be grave or solemn or tearful 
when you watch the often heart-rending struggle. No. Remember that operettas arose in the West's happiest era, and the new form reflected and embodied this fact. <clears throat> Essential to uh, operetta, therefore, is that the serious love takes place in a wonderful world, a joyous world, a fun world, one that the lovers are glad to live in. So there are lots, yes, are lots of fun things for an audience to relish. The many witty lines and lyrics, for instance, and sometimes laughable supporting characters. For example, besides the real lovers, there is often another uh, couple called uh, Soubrettes, and they are supposedly in love, but they are a comical and often farcical couple who, by contrast, make the love of the protagonist stand out as even more authentic. An example, the man uh, may be rushing to embrace the woman, but passion makes him stutter as he's singing. He's so excited that he tears her dress by hugging her so tightly, or he's so drunk that he's crawling around in the room trying to find her. It's so over the top that you have to laugh, laugh at their absurdities. And there are many other sources of humor. There is satire, too bad we don't know enough about the period to appreciate it, but there's one operator that shows Franz Joseph, the mighty emperor of the whole place, making a fool of himself, climbing up a ladder and tripping all over. And then you can see there can be circus clowns come on, related to the story, uh, chorus girls kicking just as well as the New York City Rockettes, uh, men in cow costumes uh, with only their human feet showing, mooing as they cross the stage, because one of the characters is a very big cow man, farmer, rancher. And don't forget clothing. You see older ladies, for example, often wearing uh, uh, formal but hilarious gowns, sporting colors, shapes, and accessories you never uh, imagined. So, in watching operetta, you're supposed to be absorbed and uplifted by the serious while grinning and laughing at the ridiculous. And both of these while watching the same work. And I have to tell you, just on the side, Keith Lockett saw what I'm wearing today, and he said, I see you're dressed for operetta. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you've got a serious lecture in a ridiculous shirt. <laughs> <clears throat> OK. Uh, in watching operetta, you are supposed to be enjoying yourself. The producers wanted you to come out feeling high on pleasure. And that was the standard by which critics judged operettas. If the audience came out animated and humming, the critics would praise the operetta. If the audience came out lackluster, the critic, critics would pan the show. Now you can contrast that with the, our attitude to our critics today. The audience's pleasure made operettas beloved by every class of citizen. They all waited eagerly for the next one. From what I've read, opera was popular not only in Vienna and elsewhere in Europe, it was more popular than football is here today. The theaters were packed. Some of the works enjoyed 700 consecutive performances with not a seat to spare. That's what you call a success. OK, that's for the story element. Now let's turn to the other, by far the most cherished element in operetta, music. <clears throat> While story is essential to operetta, so much more so is music, music that's integrated with the story. The basic appeal of operetta is its music. That's why the composers are justly famous and the librettists are usually unknown. Now, I'm going to be objective today, much as it kills me. 
Just as the librettist is not the great Hugo or Rostand, so the operatic composer is not the great Chopin or Rachmaninoff. In my opinion, however, just take away the sting of that. In my opinion, however, the best operatic composers, like Kalman, Lehar, and Strauss II, are great within the requirements of their art form. Now, what is the role in operetta of music, and particularly of the songs? By themselves, the songs are a delight to listen to. They can have a strong, rousing beat, or they can be exquisitely lyrically beautiful, and sometimes, to me, even more than that. Their melodies have been described by one critic as languorous, sensual, luscious, romantic. Of course, no melody can be captured by adjectives. In our context, however, even beautiful melodies are not enough. In operetta, music is essential to the story. It, it, music is not the be all and the end all. It's crucial, but it's essential to the story. The music is not only beautiful, it is what makes the story real. The music, the singing, is what makes the story real. So it's music much more than dialogue that's able to take a character's emotions and make them external. It brings inner feelings to the stage by auditory means. In other words, he brings, she, it brings those feelings to imperceptible form where you can feel that you're seeing, experiencing what they're uh, feeling. And that's what brings the character uh, to life. Now, the power of music is illustrated by a certain development in Hollywood. Yes, even in that low realm. <clears throat> the early talkies had no music, only talk and movement. When an innovator suggested that music be brought in, the studio said no. They were afraid audiences would find the music puzzling and distracting. Instead, the innovation became a huge success. Why? Because music enables the audience fully to grasp and sometimes even to feel the emotions of the characters and the mood of the scene. And in that way, enables us to experience their full reality. In the movies, music is mostly a background. In operetta, by contrast, how much greater is the power of music because the songs in operetta are featured as crucial foreground. Now, believe it or not, <coughs> I'm afraid to look at your faces, some epistemology. <laughs> the epistemology of operetta, yes, even here, you can't escape philosophy. <coughs> A story by itself can convey emotions. But by itself, without lyrics or dialogues, music, however powerful, can convey emotions only in the form of abstractions. Only in the form of abstractions. We are given grief or triumph, say, but not who is grieving or who is triumphing and over what and why. But when the story and the music play out together, the story answers such questions. It ties a song to specific people and events. It gives concretes to generalized abstractions. And as Aristotle said, concretes are what reality consists of. Now, I hope you can see now the integration of the two elements, music and story. Each requires the other. Music is essential to make the story real by giving us emotions. Story gives the music concrete, and it's the combination of these two that gives operetta its power and meaning. Now the question is, how? How does music do it? <coughs> what specific feature of music makes its emotional function possible? Unfortunately, the answer is the thing that turns most Americans off. I mean the fact that the singers sing not in the voice of Broadway or Hollywood singers, but as opera singers do. There's no difference between an operatic singer and an operetta singer <coughs> in terms of their quality. 
<laughs> How does this help in projecting emotions? Well, to answer, observe first a crucial fact about emotions. Now, I'm speaking in this whole passage about emotions as we actually experience them moment by moment. You almost never feel a given emotion as a completely unchanging experience identical across the span of time. No, in most cases, an emotion, moment by moment, changes. It changes a little or a lot, or it melts into a different emotion, and there are many other forms of change. <coughs> and emotion changes according to the changing data fed to you by your mind and or your subconscious. And all these changes take place uh, rapidly, sometimes in se seconds. Sorry, I took a pill to save my voice and it ruined my throat. Now, I call these changes <coughs> small or big <coughs> shadings. And these are specifically what operatic singers communicate. Their voice delivers the lyrics shaded. In other words, not merely in the form of generalized emotion, but more. The singers give us the emotions just as they are experienced in actual life. Not just an abstract sense, but a particular um, moment by moment uh, development. Now, how can they do this? They're classically trained, and that means they use every capacity of the human voice. They can use every capacity. Yes, every capacity. Each of these capacities can vary on a spectrum of degrees. And there are many such capacities, and they can be co combined in countless ways, all of which makes it possible for a singer to give us not merely generalized feelings like love, anger, and so on, but more. The trained voice can capture any specific form of shading, from subtle to blatant. Now, I could spend a whole lot of giving you examples, but I have to hope you can take just little examples that I give as, a, as an indi uh, indication. Take volume as one example. What might louder or softer tell us? Well, for louder, maybe anger and defiance and so on. What about softer? Maybe gentle tenderness, or maybe if it comes right after the loud, sudden hopelessness and, or grief and giving up. You can work out or read about all the possibilities. Of course, the lyrics always help. By themselves, they do not make the feelings real. Now, volume is just a start here. There is also tempo, pitch. Stuck, uh, tempo, of course, means fast or slow. And pitch is high or low, and staccato is ba 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 ba. And legato with ooh, the, the notes all go into each other. Or sostenuto, which I'm not going to illustrate. And that is where the singer holds one note longer than usual. <laughs> uh, all the different shadings, uh, uh, and there are many more tools too besides the ones I mentioned. All the different shadings are what a singer must be able to communicate if he is to be able to make an emotion second by second convincing. That's it. Have I converted you to opera or not? <laughs> now I want to touch on um, another aspect of operetta music, the various types of songs used. There are an abundance of types, marches, polkas, and many, many more. But in the Silver Age, the most distinctive and famous of all is the waltz, the rhythm of which is the star of Viennese operetta. Waltz here does not mean a form of dancing. It does not mean a form of dancing. There is little ballroom dancing in operetta, or brief snippets. Waltz is music defined by its rhythm. It's music, music defined by its rhythm, by its beat which we hear through its distinctive accent. A waltz is three-quarter time, three notes per unit. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. 
Now take that, for example, as against a march, could be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Uh, now I'm gonna give you a few lines, or mouth only, from a march of four, four, so you get the idea what it would be in music, if it comes out correctly. I want to give you a few lines from a well-known march, so you get the beat, but I'm using the only words I know, which is the joke that we used in high school when we sang this thing. So, <laughs> here it is. Be kind to your wed brother's friends, for the dark may be somebody's mother. You get it? Da 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 That's a mark. That's a 4-4. Four, four. Not only marches are that way. Uh, waltzes are essential to Viennese operetta. And they are by far my favorite rhythm. With its smooth and happy upbeat, the music seems to take me over. And in that way, none of the others do. I do enjoy 4-4. Four, four. And I keep time by tapping the, the rhythm with fingers or feet. In the waltz, however, that's not enough for me. When a waltz starts, I stop tapping and automatically, yes, from the beginning without any noticing at all, automatically my arm goes out and moves left to right and right to left as though I'm conducting. It's like I have to bring more of my body in to capture the waltz. <coughs> okay, now I've got for you a waltz from Countess Maritza by Kalman. You don't have to worry about the words. There's two lovers who are happy that they're in love and who are thanking God that there is a waltz because without a waltz, how could you uh, be ro romantic? So, all right, uh, whoever is doing the sound, this is the one time. That is a waltz. That is from Countess Maritza by Kalman, who both Armand and I thought was the greatest of the operatic composers. <coughs> All right, now I have to be honest with you. I can't tell you why the waltz is so important to operetta and to me. I've spent hours reading and thinking, but I just can't find an objective answer. So I have to be satisfied with Ayn Rand's conclusion that at present, a person's interpretation of and response to a piece of music is subjective. I'm sorry, I can't go beyond that. Actually, I mentioned the subject today in the hope that you can recognize a waltz when you hear one, and then maybe give me the answer I don't have, I wish I had. <coughs> Okay, now let's waltz over to our next and last topic. Having analyzed separately the elements of opera, let's step back and take an overview of operetta as a whole. <clears throat> and this section is called Operetta as Virtual Reality. <clears throat> Lisa has told you that I love operetta, but not why. The answer is not just in the specifics I've given you, but in something much wider <laughs> that they embody. I will introduce you to this by this. Some months ago, I read a lengthy article in the New York Post, which is the only people I like and read, the only paper I like and read daily. An article about virtual reality. And hereafter, I'm gonna say a lot of times, there's VR. <laughs> and the, the article included the incredible achievements it has made possible. Now, here's just one example of them. Now, this is the first that leaped out at me when I was reading. A pregnant woman needed an episiotomy. In the first draft, I was going to tell you what that is, but that's gone. <laughs> but it's a procedure to allow sufficient clearance, you can guess where, for the birth. <laughs> now, episiotomy is considered by many doctors to be the most agonizingly painful procedure for the patient. And the woman had not had an epidural. So what could her doctor do? He enlisted a VR therapist. The man told him, in essence, <laughs> that he could put her in a VR. He situated her within an apparatus which controlled her senses. The only thing she could see 
was the video he had prepared. The only thing she could hear was its audio. And with special gloves, the, he arranged so that when she was touching an object that wasn't there, she felt it. <clears throat> what she saw on the video was a world of penguins in a snow field. Penguins who were playfully throwing snowballs at each other. She was 100% entranced by this. The doctor then went ahead with the unbearable procedure. When she was brought back uh, to this world, the first thing she asked was, when are you going to start on me? She had felt no pain. She had been fully occupied in absorbing the new world. There was no space left in her brain for anything else. She took her sense perceptions in the VR as perceptions of reality, just as we take our sense perceptions as perceptions of reality. <clears throat> now, for the first time, I got a clue to understanding why Operetta is so huge to me. But get this ready before I start. <clears throat> Operetta is my penguins in the snow. In this respect, I am just like the woman. But it is not penguins, it is operettas that I perceive in my VR. And I get to it without needing a special apparatus. <clears throat> now I say that this was a clue, but not a full understanding of my response because I still didn't know why it is operetta, and only operetta, that moves me into a VR. Why not the other forms of the story-music combination? Why not opera or musical? <laughs> now here's when I start on the other two. <laughs> I guess star on is not the right way to put it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> opera. Without dialogue, opera can tell a story only in a very generalized way, only through the lyrics of its arias. If you want to find out what specifically is happening on the stage, you have to read the program. Here's another point about opera. It's almost completely focused on the music and especially on the singing. That's the reason people go to an opera, to see and hear the sopranos, the tenors, and the rest. In this way, Opera is similar to, not the same as, but similar to a concert. And now another point. What about philosophically? <laughs> philosophically, most operas are tragic. They usually have a miserable ending, in part because they are not products of the special super happiest age. Do you uh, remember Aida, how it ends? The two lovers are still alive but they're in a grave waiting to die together. And I looked that up on the computer and it gives a lot of other endings of operas. A quote from just one article. Uh, endings include, quote, stabbing, suicides, strangulation, and more. <laughs> so you're not gonna make a mistake and laugh there. In opera, values are of great importance, they are. The people feel passionately and act, and act accordingly. So values are of great importance in opera, and you should pursue them intensely. But you are doomed to failure in your pursuit. You are doomed to failure. And opera represents what Ayn Rand would call a malevolent universe. If you're taking notes, just make capital M-U. <laughs> opera represents what Ayn Rand would call a malevolent universe. A, male a malevolent universe is not the kind of place where you can achieve your values, not even if they and your pursuit of them are rational. That is why in the common classification of the arts, opera comes under tragedy. Now musical. In regard to story, they're better than opera, but the stories are not concerned with stressing a character's values. In other words, musicals don't give us real, I mean believable, emotions. The lover's love, for instance, is not presented or is not intended or presented to be real. So I can't take it and the other feelings seriously. 
Now take Guys and Dolls, for example. It's my favorite musical, but it's a musical. It doesn't put me into another reality. At one point, Miss Adelaide sings to express her pain at her man's indifference. Because of it, she sings, quote, a poison can develop a cold. That gives you the scale of the love and the scale of the uh, in, important. <coughs> now, a more important, fa important fact here about uh, opera, about musicals, is that the singing voices are not operatic. And what they sing are pop tunes without the evocative power of the music in the other form. So, uh, now philosophically, what are musicals? In a single word, zero. They're not concerned with universal scope, deeply held values, or any of that. These are irrelevant in a musical and would be damaging to it. <laughs> now, I don't mean to put musicals down. I've enjoyed a number of Broadway and Hollywood musicals. I've even enjoyed some operas. But many musicals have catchy tunes, cute characters, funny situations. But that's it. It's, that's what you get. <coughs> As I see it, musicals are not a form of art, but of entertainment. So musicals are correctly classified as comedies in the modern sense of the term. So grand opera is tragedy. Musicals are comedy. So what in this context is uh, Operetta. Operetta gives us a concrete story with emphasis on the character's pursuit of values, which pursuit for the most part leads them to a joyous finale. And then when the curtain comes down, people all have a wild the cast, has a wild melee of dancing and singing the songs from the operetta, while one of the, the one who's taking the credits comes forward and nods and then he goes back. And at the end of it all, you're all revved up and they have a massive show of fireworks. More than I've seen in Fourth of July here, because the idea is this is a celebration, it's fantastic, we have to mark it. And those fireworks, to me, are a very, very nice touch. <laughs> in other words, put it another way, opera is a world in which man can achieve his values. It's a world which Ayn Rand called benevolent universe, benevolent universe. <clears throat> Malevolent, you can't. Benevolent, you can. And operetta is the only one of the three forms that can give you a benevolent universe. <coughs> now, uh, if you're following me, you must be wondering, if BU is what you crave, what about literature? Can a novel, for instance, give you a benevolent universe? Yes, of course it can, and Ayn Rand's novels are the perfect examples. But literature is a conceptual medium. It consists of words. And that fact, its medium, that's what makes it, to me personally, impossible to create a benevolent universe in the form I want, in the form I crave. Now, I hope you understand what I'm saying here. I love operetta, but I do not believe that even the best common operetta is superior to or even equal to Atlas Shrugged. No, please don't insult me. What I love in operetta is the benevolent universe it provides. Uh, but there's something else that I crave. Let me explain by first giving you a few relevant concretes. <clears throat> Ask yourself if the lady in the VR could have become pain-free if, instead of seeing the penguins in the snow, someone read her a detailed description of the sea. That's pretty obvious that she couldn't. Now, here's another concrete. There's all kinds of this, and a point I've yet to make. <clears throat> a while back, Jerome Brook told me that when he wants to get the news, he doesn't turn to TV. No, he turns to the written words, like in newspapers or on a computer. I asked him why, and in essence, he told me, in watching TV and looking directly at evil people and vicious events, 
with no intermediary. Whereas from written news, I am to an extent removed from this. I still get the content, but it is not right here in the room with me. TV in that way makes it more real than words can. Now let me explain these two cases, the VR lady and your own TV. VR and TV are both perceptual. Both depend on our perceiving, seeing, and hearing as against reading words. Words are integrations of percepts, but they are not themselves percepts. Now you can see the full reason why I love operators. It is the benevolent universe in perceptual form, in its most direct and real form. And that means something else, another bonus. To get a universe from a novel, uh, uh, you can't just sit back and let the pages take over your mind. To get and keep the meaning of all the pages, you have to integrate all the words, detect connections, sometimes puzzle out uh, subtleties. Maybe you have to reread an earlier passage. And in my case, unfortunately, I sometimes even edit paragraphs from lesser books. Uh, given my teaching histories, I just can't resist it. It's automatized. So my point is here that reading a novel is work, mental work. Reading a good novel is, of course, very enjoyable work, but it is still work. And I, at my age, have reached the point where I want not only to get the benevolent universe in its most real form, but more. I want to get it in a lot easier way. And for operetta, I just have to get up from my chair and put on a DVD. There's no mental work in that. <coughs> I think you can see now why the world of operetta uplifts me, gives me exhilaration, admiration, and freedom from what's outside, at least for a couple of hours. There was no free space in my mind to take a cognizance of today's disasters. I am absorbed 100% by my penguins. They fill my brain and push anything else out, not only in psychological terms, but also in physical terms. For example, one day I told Art, my opera, operetta friend, that I had a bad a headache and couldn't come over. But I ended up going anyway, I couldn't resist it. And as soon as the operator started and all through it, I had no headache, not even after it was over. It just disappeared. I had to stick on the last page. <laughs> or once I said to Art while yawning that I was too exhausted, but again, I did go and when the show was over, I was full of energy. In both cases, and others too, the negative recedes, and I'm left only with pleasure and more pleasure. <laughs> what I hope today is that this lecture will identify for you a mostly unknown way of experiencing inspiration and affirmation of your value. I am not Columbus, but I want to help you to discover a new world. So come with me on the Nina, and let's have a ball. Thank you. It wasn't that good. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't think it was that good, but I appreciate it. <laughs> it, was. it was. OK, now we're going to go to the excerpts. We have I've cut out some little sections from Circus Princess, which is one of Coleman's operators, and one from uh, uh, Charles Furston, which is uh, Gypsy Princess, which is another one of his. Uh, I'm not, I want to do the first, I want to give you the story. How does an operator tell a story? Of course, I can't give you the whole thing, because there's two and a half hours in development. But what I'm going to give you is a few excerpts. And then before each, I want to tell you what you would have known if you had seen the whole operator, so that the excerpts won't be un, uh, unintelligible. 
And here I want you to get the idea of the story. I'm not pushing the music here. Now, the first excerpt we're going to hear, Princess Fedora, that's the woman. Princess Fedora and Mr. X. He is a trapeze artist, and he loves her deeply. They were together in their youth, and he loved her, and they seemed to be getting along, and then she broke away. And he hasn't seen her then, and he's in great pain thinking of her love. And then one day, she comes to the circus to see Mr. X, who she heard so much about. Now, you have to know the convention in operettas is that a mask wipes out the whole face. If you're wearing a mask, you look like one thing. If you take your mask off, you're an utterly different person. Because they couldn't put masks and still sing through them. It was like the mask today. So you have to accept the, the fact that if he's got his uh, black eyes on, and she then sees him without a mask, she has no idea it's him. So there's a lot of things <clears throat> I have to fill in for you. <clears throat> You'll see for the first time Prince Sergius, who is the villain. An aristocrat who's a real villain. And he's mad at Fedora because uh, he made a pass at her once and she pushed him away in a completely unrespectful way in his mind. And he now says he's got to have vengeance for that. <clears throat> his idea of a plot is to degrade her by having her suckered into a marriage with a commoner. Now, Sergius knows what Mr. X looks like really, with no mask, and chooses him as the groom-to-be. So the vengeance will be, she marries the, the man with that unknown face, she's actually marrying a commoner, so she's, uh, uh, so uh, Sergius says, to X, go up to her apartment and get her to respond to you. But she doesn't know who it is because he's not got his mask on. And therefore you can't see, she can't see that it's Mr. X at all. And he agrees to do it. Why is he part of this scheme? Because uh, he has to be alone to her. It's been so long and he has to take the chance to be alone to her. He is introduced to her as Prince Korosov. Of course, he's not. He's not a prince at all. But the idea is, it, is that prince and princess, a natural pair to marry. Uh, she starts to respond to him. All this actually happens in the opera. Uh, so Sergius, in his wickedness, creates a fake letter from the Tsar, pretends it's from the Tsar with a content that is intended to push her into marriage. Now I have to give you the end of the story. <clears throat> and I picked this operetta because it's the one I give to Americans who start off thinking, oh, it's all you know, queens and archdukes and so on who walk around in boudoirs and so on. It's not that. <laughs> this will surprise you, but this is operetta. I bet 90% of you who don't know about it would never have predicted that such a thing could happen. <clears throat> anyway, maybe I built you up too much now. <clears throat> now, the last excerpt, the marriage has taken place to him, but without his mask. And he is outraged that she married somebody else. Uh, she didn't know that it was him, so from his point of view, she took somebody else above him. Um, uh, so he thinks to himself, I've lost her. And I have to keep my self-respect. So to keep my self-respect, I have to do something in my field unprecedented because it is so dangerous. Uh, so I'm giving you that from there on to the end. We didn't record the fireworks. <laughs> now, does that change your idea of operetta? <laughs> I, I watched this a number, many times, and I always afraid he's not going to make it. 
<laughs> now, next is a brief excerpt from Gypsy Princess by Coleman. And it was just to show you the kind of spectacles that Operetta pre presents. Now, you've seen something of a spectacle here, but I want to show you this one. All they do is take a little song, and they redo it five times and see what happens with each one. You get an idea of singing versus sheer spectacle. They're singing, but they're putting before your eyes so much that you can't take it in. OK, do this. So is that good? So now you have an idea of what opera is, <coughs> not just from my words, <coughs> but from seeing some uh, indication of what it's like. It can tell a story, and one that's believable and even suspenseful. <coughs> and it's not just two people standing on a stage warbling to each other. This is the kind of thing it can do. There are some times where two lovers you know, um, express their love or their grief or whatever, but that is not the only thing that is an operetta. There's a lot of stuff like this, a lot of funny stuff, uh, great spectacles, and uh, just take, keep that in mind. That's why you have to see it on a DVD. If you just heard that on the, on the uh, CD, it wouldn't mean a thing, right? It's just the same song five times. But they did it in all different ways. Okay, now I've been asked about a question period. <laughs> my voice is going, and the rest of my body is too. But I'll try to do a few questions as long as you know, I can physically can do it, but not for long. <clears throat> um, but I have a certain criteria here. It has to be questioned about tonight's lecture, it can, or today's lecture. It can't be about the wokes and all the rest of it. Strictly re re referring to operetta. <clears throat> and uh, uh, it can't presuppose that I'm an expert or a scholar on operetta. I don't want a question like, Mr. Smolnitsky in Romania had an operetta in 1812, and you, what you say about operettas is not true of his. I don't want to hear that. <clears throat> I'm not saying I know any more than the operas I mentioned and any more about them than I already told you. So you've cleaned the slate. But if you want to ask questions about it to fulfill those requirements or about my response, go ahead. I can't see because of the light. You'll have to tell me. I can't hear a word. I wanted to tell you that we have an online audience who have been watching you this whole uh, lecture. The numbers have been close to 470 while we've been here in this room, in addition to everyone here. So what is 470 and 160? <laughs> what does that add up to? Oh, that's OK. <laughs> they're, not getting to ask, they're not getting to ask any questions, only the folks are here. Thank you, Dr. Peikoff. You've inspired me to go out and see one of these from start to finish. Um, my question is, if you don't speak German, um, are there any in, not Viennese, but are there any in English? And if it was translated with like them singing in English, do you think you would appreciate it more, or the audience would appreciate well, it more? Well, you know, it's a funny thing. <clears throat> Some people do. But I don't like operators in English <clears throat> for one reason. I want the feeling that it's another world. And if they're talking in English, it's too much like this world, you know. But if they're talking in German and there's titles, I know what, they say, what they're saying so I can follow the whole thing. But it's in another world. It's how they communicate, you know. Uh, so to me, uh, I, I had some in English when I first started. Oh, that's, that's no good. Uh, but you can get them, but mostly there's no audience in the United States. Thank you very much. Okay. Dr. Peikoff, yes. what are your, say, two favorite Kalman Lehar operettas, and what is your favorite Strauss Jr. operetta? Say, say it again. I can't hear uh, I'm asking for your favorites. What are, say, your top one or two Kalman and Lehar favorites, and what is your favorite Strauss Jr. favorite? Well, didn't you get the whole uh, sheet printed out? It was handed out to you. Anyway, I, I'll I, tell I you. didn't read it, I'm sorry. I'll tell you. 
Kalman, I love everything, but I think Gypsy Princess is his top one. And I guess Countess Mauritia would be regarded as his second. And Circus Princess, which I really love, as you can see, is considered a little bit, you know, not as, I don't know, it, it's considered fine, but uh, I, in some way, I hate to say this because I lose face, I, in some way, like Circus Princess better, even though the music and the others are better and everything, but it's got that joy, you know, the circus and the clowns and the trapeze, how long it the beautiful city. <coughs> now, for um, uh, Lehar, uh, we pick um, Mary Widow uh, is the top. And I had brought a whole list for you. Didn't you get it? I'm sure I did. Uh, perhaps the, yeah, uh, those online, uh, listening yeah. online did not. Mary Widow, on the other good one of Lehar's is the Land of Smiles. Uh, uh, you want a two from him or a three? Oh, that, that'll do. Uh, how about Strauss Jr.? Do you have a favorite from okay, him? Okay, now, the, uh, the later mouse, which means it's a bat, uh, is Strauss's most famous uh, operetta. Uh, the trouble with Strauss is he lived in the 19th century. That's why I said he was a mixed case. He has great stuff, but there's usually, almost always, a, a comedic tone to it all. So you can't give your heart to the love story. You know, they're kind of laughing, but not blatantly. Uh, but you can tell they don't really mean it. Uh, so, Flatermouse is like that, but the one that I've ever found of Strauss where it does not have that uh, comedic, self-mocking background is the Gypsy Baron. Uh, that's just a good operetta. It's not common in Leha, but it's a good operetta, and uh, it doesn't have any of that 19th century clowning around. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could recommend, uh, for those of us not lucky enough to have your same neighbor, I, make out your words. Sorry, I was wondering if you could recommend a particular productions or DVDs or actors, directors that people should keep an eye out for? Well, I can give you the, the top production in the world in history, which is still functional. It goes back, oh God, no, early 20th century. No, mid, I guess. I don't know, maybe <laughs> Now write this down. <laughs> I'm going to pronounce it in the German way and then I'll spell it because art taught me how to say it. Mervis. <laughs> Mervis. Now it's M O with an umlaut R B I S C H. That has a gigantic stage, it's open stage. Open, there's no ceiling. You can see the stars up in the, when you go to the performance, and there's a lake right behind it to the lovers to step onto the boat and sing their love song as you're going down the lake. Now, this is the fanciest, most, you know, nothing in the world could compare to that. It's, and they have, I, think, I can't remember, 10,000 at a time, I think. In that. It's a gigantic, absolutely thing. And everything they do is at the top right. They do the, the subtle humor, the best, they don't overdo it. They have really great singers. The only problem, but that's the problem with all operas, is that the sopranos, who really know the, a way to do it, are, have learned that by singing so many years. And therefore, they're supposed to be these young, beautiful girls, and they come in, and she's definitely 40. Uh, but, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. The younger ones are good, but the great ones have lived through that, you see. So, so that's a... If I can ask, a theater where we could go to see it live, is there a, to get DVDs, you mentioned DVDs. I can't make out your Sorry, record. you'd mentioned watching the DVDs. Is there a yeah. particular company or place to buy well, DVDs? I get them from Amazon usually, or there's a weird little store that you can find in the computer, which I found, called Bob's. And what he does is he makes deals with old people that when they die, He'll buy their estate, uh, pay them, and then he turns around and charges the customers here who are alive who want to buy those. And he makes a lot of money doing that. Um, I went once to get one of his uh, operators, and uh, I wonder what the price was, and he said, this is what it was written in actual letters, quote, under $2,000, close quote. 
And people pay that, you know, because they're desperate to get something new. Um, so I would say over and above Mürbisch, you, could, you should really stick to uh, German uh, opera, because that's really the center in all of it. You can find some good ones, even a good one from Soviet Russia, believe it or not. It's a gypsy princess, but done in a, in a very good way. And the reason they did that is because they wanted to impress the West that they have high art too. So they, they didn't like it at all, but it was propaganda. But they did do a good uh, performance. So I don't know what else to tell you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> you mentioned the operetta was the West's happiest era. Yeah. And that made me wonder if this was also your favorite civilization. I know you gave a lecture many years ago about how ancient Greece was your favorite civilization. I was wondering if that might have changed. I don't know. That's a, I'd like to go to one and then to the other. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't go so far because to be in the same room with Aristotle and talk to him and look at that whole civilization, I th at this stage I would say I don't have enough of that in relation to operetta, so I would take that. But hopefully I could bring some equipment with me and I always wonder how Aristotle would react to operetta. Because <laughs> they didn't have any of our instruments or music or anything, so either they would say how fantastic or they would say what the hell is that noise? <laughs> I'd be really curious to see, but that's what I would answer. <clears throat> would you like to take some more questions at this time? Yeah, a few. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Peacock, first, uh, thank you. You're and uh, I was wondering, uh, with the form of operetta being primarily perceptual, uh, and you're mentioning that uh, it, it can't quite um, achieve the, the depth of the more conceptual art forms. Uh, do you imagine it, it, it I'm wondering what, what is the uh, distinctive factor that, that makes that so? Can, can you imagine uh, operetta being produced, uh, replicating some of the, the, the Greek um, no. depths of form? I can't see operetta with the ancient classic context. It would, it would not, not fit in. They were a great civilization, but they were not a happy civilization the way we are. They depended on slaves. They had no technology. You know, and there was, especially in Athens, the democracy was shaky and you know, gave way to disaster at the end. And the Roman Empire gave way to disaster. Uh, so I would like to visit there, but uh, I wouldn't, you couldn't bring that world into the classic world. One is great on the level of abstract philosophy. And one is great on the level of concretize a certain kind of philosophy. But to put the two of them together, I don't know. I, I don't see it. Although I would love to see Aristotle's reaction. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Peacock. Uh, thank you for that. I'm happy, I'm always happy to find something new that's exciting for me to get into. And I think this will be that. Um, so naturally, while I was listening to this, I was comparing to Mozart's comic operas, especially The Marriage of Figaro, um, which... Cosi fan tutti, too, right? Yeah. And, and I was... It's really optimistic, and when I saw it, I had that like infectious feeling you were describing that the audience might have after a Viennese operetta. Um, no, he, he writes comic operas. Uh, th those ones are, you know, they have a story and everything, but I don't, to me, they don't create a world, but you could say they're in the category of, uh, of musicals, or they're in the category, you might stretch it to the point of saying, it's in the category of, of operetta, but it lacks certain things. It doesn't have dialogue. It doesn't have, the, it has silly little laughs, but it doesn't have humor in the way of these fantastic spectacles and trapeze and so on. So it's got some of the attributes. It's got a lighter uh, lyrics and lighter music. And there is a cheerful you know, note in it, but it's, it's like, I don't know how I put it. It's like an opera composer who was uh, trying to get into operetta, but 
not that he was, but that he didn't make it. Yeah, that's kind of what I was asking about the, uh, you were talking about the benevolent universe premise in yeah. Viennese operetta. One thing that I found a little bit unsatisfying in Mozart's operas, in the comic operas, is they resolve, it seems like by chance. Like, yeah. they, it's like an inverted farce where just things happen to go right by luck, basically. But you know, and you I was wondering if that's kind of what happens here. You can't expect too much <laughs> literary quality in stories that are written only to be the vehicle for music. So, uh, you know, if they rest on a coincidence, as long as it doesn't tear the whole thing apart, he goes to the drugstore, well, there's no drugstore, but he goes to the drugstore and she meets him there, and you know, and uh, his uncle is hers, etc. There's a lot of coincidence, but I can take that if what happens then uh, is meaningful to me. So, I don't hold them, Victor Hugo did that, you know, um, John Valzan is walking along, he just happened to stumble on Cosette. You know, and the whole thing is by accident. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, accept that. Okay. But you don't have that standards of plot in a music story combination. Yeah. All right, thank you. Hello, I was really interested in how you took Not this, enough, this passion of yours during the time when you can't overcame COVID. Can you talk a little bit about what it was that, that inspired you? Were you, did you? were you already into this passion before COVID set in, or did it come to you as you were sick? Oh no, it's a and, couple of years ago. And how did, it get, how did it get you through? You talked about it being the penguin for you. Well, it, it came more because I met Art. He was in, we were both in retirement home. Uh, and he had this huge DVD collection. And he found me as someone who really liked it. He, he had all the operators you could imagine. So he uh, told me to come over, and I really loved it. And so we made it every week, and we're still doing it. Every week I go to his place, and he plays me another one. Uh, that's what brought me in. I had never seen a DVD of operetta. I had only had CDs. Uh, and this was the first time I saw the whole thing and it's a tremendous, tremendous difference. You can love the music, but it's not comparable to seeing it actually happen. You know? And so did you, when you were ill and sick, did you, did, did you watch these operettas? Oh, during? no. I, the only thing the hospital had was a story about dogs. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was a good story. The Purpose of Dogs, I think it was called. They had a movie of that, and then I had somebody buy the book. So I just alternated between watching the movie and reading the book. Um, uh, no, in the hospital, the only reason I thought of Operetta was I had been talking to Lisa about maybe doing a talk someday, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I didn't have anything to do, so I, my mind, if I give it the order, well, I'm going to do something, sometimes it just starts giving me things. So I was just taking notes, that's all. Mm, well, so, <coughs> great. Thank you so much for your... It wasn't because of COVID, no. There's still more? There are, uh, there's one more question, and uh, we'd like everyone just to stay in the room when the questions are over. We have a surprise coming. Very briefly, uh, I noticed that my top favorite, Di Bayadero, is missing from your recommendations. Uh, is there a, a reason you prefer uh, Circus Princess as yours? No, I think objectively and officially, Gypsy Princess. But personally, because I use it so often, to bludgeon Americans into operetta, it's become the one I play the most. <coughs> That's it? Okay. The period of opera and operetta were roughly the same time in their heyday, if, unless I'm mistaken, the 19th century, maybe early 20th, yet one has a malevolent sense which, of... Which is the other one but besides operetta? Opera. You oh, said, well, opera goes way back. Okay, but I'm curious. It's not 19th century, it goes way back. And the, the canons and the approach of it was established long ago and did not change. It didn't change with different cultures. It stays the same to this day. But if, I was wondering if, if there's at least overlap in the periods, why one consistently had a malevolent sense of life, whereas the other had. Well, I don't think opera has to uh, 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 be. Uh, what it is, and it doesn't have to be 
uh, it has to be tragic, I think, because if you have, unless you make it a cross between a musical uh, and an opera. If you had an opera where, but they can't do it singing, you know, if, if they're going to sing operatic voice, they can't do it to Miss Alloy. I mean, if that's the kind of story, you can't, you know, she's the woman from uh, God's Adult. Uh, if, you're, if you're going to combine those two, you're going to lose something of each of them, because <laughs> they each have certain virtues. Operate as a display for beautiful, uh, the top type of music, and in the top kind of voices. So if what you're after is a musical uh, experience, you can't be uh, operetta. But if you, uh, and if you want something light and relaxing and, you know, fun, but it doesn't mean much and you forget it when you leave, that's musical. And if you want a combination of something, uh, not the composers are not on the level of the great composers, but to tell you the truth, I listen to them 10 times more than I listen to the great composers because that's the one that's in my uh, system now. So they can have certain elements of operetta, but that doesn't make them the same. Thank you. Okay. Now we can end this now, I think, right? No, we have to end it. Yeah. It's almost two hours, can you believe it? Yeah. I thought I was going to do one hour. So we're going to give it a little, couple of minutes for everyone to get a glass. So this is for you. I don't have to talk after yeah, I drink. Leonard said after champagne, he's not talking. No, I think we got it. So at least I want to you tell me when. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll give it a couple of minutes for, for people to get it. So in the meantime, um, we have another thing for you. So first, thank you, Leonard, for so grateful sure for you can. honoring us with your lecture. Uh, so we have a small gift as a token of our appreciation. Yeah, yeah. It's you a musical opera. What? <laughs> you find another opera? No. I'm going to write one, maybe. Um, <laughs> It's a musical portfolio with selection of Grafin Morita uh, by Emmerich Emmer, Emmer, Kalman. Sorry, Emmer, Kalman, yes. And it's featuring it? original music sheets from the 1924 when the yeah, operetta saw? that was uh, distributed God, as part. That's like touching something written by Aristotle. Yeah. Oh, look so at this that. is the original, was this, was original this, program. Th this is in the original, the primary the yes. introduction. So I was. A, I, I was told oh, that I'm allowed to take one out and show it to the audience, because there's several. Don't get fingerprints on it. Yes, I'll try. Where is Jeff Breeding? Don't look. I have no more wall left to hang that. OK, so this is, this is the program. This is how it looks. It's beautiful. And it's actually a music sheet. This is from the 1920s? Yes. Really? So how did you get it? You'll have to ask Tom about <laughs> Oh my god, you've got the music in this. No, I wish I had known German. I could say where it came from. I have learned this. Well, thank you very much. I, appreciate it. I have learned a few words in German, but the best I can do is mach schnell, which means make it fast. And uh, would you like to make a toast? Yes, OK. Now they all sit or stand. Which way? Oh, however you want. You want to stand? <laughs> this is to operetta and the pleasure that it can bring all of us. Salute. Cheers. Cheers. And Dr. Peacock. <laughs> Dr. Peacock. <laughs> so, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I invite you to join us for a reception in the Orchard Terrace. We'll have some light refreshments and a specially designed cake. We took the picture, this red one, and we printed it on a large cake that I know you like. So well, if you're going to yeah. join us, you're going to have cake. Well, I, I would like to join, but I won't be able to talk, sit, or stand. <laughs> so you're I'm welcome not. to join us. So, I'll try for a little bit. Okay. Minutes. So you're all welcome to join us, and thank you for coming. I know a lot of you flew in, so thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>